Hello and welcome to the closing plenary. Congratulations on making it this far. Woo! So in light of the deliberative process where we bring together people coming from many different backgrounds and experiences, you've seen students, you've heard from um, uh, educators, whether in schools, in libraries, you've heard from journalists, you've heard from academics, you've heard from people who are just interested in these issues today. Throughout the day, you've been asked to develop recommendations. Maybe some of you have felt forced, but that is this process. There is some forcing that happens, uh, only because the goal is to take policy out of the hands of the policy makers who have their own processes that may seem more public or more thorough than something like this. But this is just a start. Uh, the conversation that we're about to have now is to advance the recommendations, so we will stay focused on the 11 recommendations that ca have come out of the sessions. I've heard 11, I've heard 13. We're still <laughs> trying to figure out how many have come, but uh, they have come. We've translated them uh, very quickly uh, into the two languages. We'll put them on the screen, and you're welcome to bring forward comments that advance, that problematize, that question these recommendations. We will move fairly quickly through them because we want to see the, uh, the, the outcomes of your work. We want to see it all, so we will go fairly quickly, and that's my role as facilitator. Hi, my name is Gretchen. Uh, I wanted to introduce very quickly Pascal Saint-Ange, who is uh, president of the Federation Nationale de Communication in, here in Quebec. Pascal, thank you for joining us. Uh, Kevin Chan is here with us from Facebook. He's the global director and head of public policy. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us. And then Normand is here as well. We don't need to introduce Normand. He's been talked about too much the last few days. Uh, but thank you all again for sticking through. Um, I hope you have had coffee and some sugar because this is going to be an intensive round. If you thought uh, game shows on television were fun, this is going to be even better. So we're going to move through these policy recommendations fairly quickly and you will have a microphone floating in the audience. We will also hear from our panelists on each one. So, number one, that political and media literacy be integrated within the training of teachers and other educators through pedagogy, curricula, institutional culture within schools beginning in elementary. So again, this speaks to training of teachers. I wanna highlight that the next uh, uh, recommendation also speaks to training of teachers. So I wanna I bring that up here as well. Include in the training of teachers a course on media and digital content that will address the pedagogical posture needed to foster the development of ethical and critical judgment of young people in connection with digital use. So we will open up for about five minutes discussion these two recommendations on the kind of uh, education opportunities, the training that teachers themselves have access to, whether focused on political and media literacy or developing ethical and critical judgment. For our, our panelists, do you have any comments on these two recommendations? Anything that you want to suggest to advance or question what you see in front of you? It is a game show format, so you have to talk right away if you're going to talk. Otherwise, we're going to go to the audience. Kevin. Uh, well, tout d'abord, mer merci. Uh, C'est une honneur d'être ici avec vous, et merci Norman pour, pour l'invitation. Uh, um, so, I, you know, I think this makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, you know, I, I think the challenge, in, indeed, is, is that I think, well, I mean, I think individuals can always have um, better media literacy um, or digital literacy, but, but I think um, uh, it's important to make sure that the people who are teaching also have the same, um, the same level of, of, of fluency or, or numeracy and, and, and literacy on this stuff. I think the challenge, though, in Canada, right, c'est qu'on a, on a 10 provinces, alors un système qui est fragmenté, Et c'est difficile de... On, on peut faire ça ici au Québec, right? Mais ça, c'est... Il y, y a un gouvernement, et peut-être c'est plus facile, mais si on parle de... Uh, si on parle de à travers le Canada, c est, c est, je pense que c'est beaucoup plus difficile, parce qu'encore, il faut avoir des ententes um, à travers dix provinces et trois territoires. Ça, c'est... Um, c'est quelque chose qui est beaucoup plus difficile à, 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 à opéra, opérationnel... La, 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 opré, mais, merci, Simon. C'est ça, exactement. Exactement ce que Simon vient de dire. Sure. Very quickly, Norman, go ahead. 
Le, une fois qu'on a des politiques publiques qui font l'éducation aux médias une priorité dans nos curriculums scolaires, il y, a, il y a trois piliers essentiels de la réussite de nos politiques éducatives. La première, c'est évidemment la formation. La formation des maîtres initiales, mais aussi en formation continue. La deuxième, c'est le support. C'est fondamental, un support, notamment avoir accès aux équipements, avoir accès aux techniciens, avoir accès à des ressources compétentes. Et le troisième, c'est la reconnaissance professionnelle, qui est absolument fondamentale. Il doit y avoir des incitatifs dans les carrières des enseignants pour pouvoir développer euh, des pratiques pédagogique plus conséquente en éducation aux médias. Donc, bien évidemment, pour moi, et je suis absolument ravi de le voir au tableau, la question des for de la formation, mais je le répète, continue et euh, au cours de leur étude universitaire est absolument cruciale. Et je crois personnellement qu'on ne peut pas être contre la vertu euh, dans le sens où, dans un monde idéal, il faudrait inclure le plus possible la, la littératie numérique dans le cursus scolaire et ça, dans, dans l'entièreté du parcours. Euh, cependant, euh, je crois qu'il y a une difficulté et un défi majeur euh, qui est celui de suivre l'évolution des technologies. Euh, non seulement ça, mais le fait que ces technologies-là sont entre les mains d'entreprises qui détiennent la vérité aussi sur leurs propres technologies. Donc, de décrypter, en fait, le fonctionnement véritable et complexe de ces technologies-là euh, pour réellement euh, arriver à en saisir toute la mécanique c'est un défi, donc de l'inclure le plus possible dans le cursus scolaire, absolument, mais je pense qu'il va falloir aussi avoir une transparence des, de toutes ces nouvelles technologies-là qui sont disponibles et autour de ça, ça va prendre une volonté politique pour développer cette culture de la transparence. So, any reaction from anyone in the audience with regard to these two recommendations coming out of the conversations today? If you can come to the, the microphone, go ahead, please. Oui, merci. Euh, je trouve ça super intéressant, mais je proposerais euh, de remplacer le mot « jugement » dans « jugement éthique » et « critique » par la réflexion éthique et l'analyse critique. C'est peut-être technique, mais je trouve que le mot « jugement » est quand même connoté. Là. Donc, euh, c'est ça. Je, je remplacerais le mot « jugement » par « réflexion éthique », puis je préciserais de l'analyse critique, parce que « critique », on l'utilise à toutes sortes de, de sens. Mais si on pousse les, les jeunes puis les futurs enseignants à faire de l'analyse critique, en, de se mettre en position d'analyse, je, je trouvais ça encore plus intéressant. OK, thank you for that. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jessie from Hands On Media. Um, obviously, I think that we need more digital and media literacy training for teachers. That's a given. Um, but I think the elephant in the room for me uh, in this whole discussion is talking about classroom size. and and actually how tired teachers are right now. Um, we can talk about all kinds of training, but if, if we're talking, like I, I was just meeting with the English Montreal School Board, some of their, their classes are 35 students. You're talking about totally reinventing how they teach and, and with what tools. The class size is too big to get these kinds of things started. If we're talking about a dream, changing policies, that would be my kind of policy making. Lower class size, let's get that working and then increase the size to what they need to handle. So uh, changing specific wording or asking for a specification of like maybe adding something around class size, like maintaining small class sizes while building in uh, these modules around uh, media literacy training within education programs. These are the kind of feedback that can further advance these recommendations. So good work on the first set. Let's move on. Um, I know we're going quickly, but we have to. So this next one is called, uh, is number three, promoting, to promote the establishment of a network of expertise that mandates the pooling of all media and digital literacy practice and research communities in order to break down silos between researchers and people in the field while ensuring the work of uh, the network spreads internationally. So this is building uh, pools of expertise. Any thoughts about this recommendation? Yeah. Yeah, I'll start with that one. I, you know, I think that's a great one. I, was, I think I was actually in the session that, that came up with that. I think it's really good. I mean, you know, it's interesting. So in my job, in my day job in public policy at Facebook, you know, we, you know, we, we deal with this sort of stuff, but we also have, um, we also spend a lot of time on the safety world, the online safety world. And actually there, there is this hugely developed network. It's called PrevNet. You, you may know of it, but it's like this sort of a healthy relationship network. Media Smarts, who's here, they're also part of the PrevNet. And there is a very developed ecosystem about online safety. And, and, and in fact, next week at McGill, um, Shaheen Sharif, uh, who is uh, one of the leading thinkers on cyberbullying, she actually won a, a SHRC partnership grant, right, where she's actually bringing together not just 
uh, academics from across the country who are seized with the issue. But she's bringing in NGOs, uh, so members of civil society. She's bringing um, uh, uh, you know, companies uh, that are that are that have a stake in this, like like Facebook. Um, and so that is an excellent idea. Uh, it is it is already deeply rooted uh, in different different pieces of the online uh, space, like safety. Um, and, um, and it would be really great to, to see that sort of thing happen uh, in, on the media literacy side as well. Do people in the audience have anything to add, any of our panelists to add to this recommendation about pooling, promoting a network of expertise? We have some other recommendations later on that'll bring in the, the role of community media and libraries um, in this network of expertise as well. We'll come to that in a second. Point four, ask government to recognize the importance of the challenges facing media and citizenship education by investing resources in the creation of this network of excellence and national policy of media and digital literacy education. Thoughts about that? Pascal? Mais je pense que ça, ça va vraiment à la base et à la racine, euh, en fait, du questionnement qu'on doit avoir par rapport au système de l'éducation. Euh, Est-ce qu'on forme des travailleurs ou on forme aussi des citoyens. Euh, puis à ce moment-là, quand on, on tranche cette question, ben je pense que ça influence nos investissements puis euh, là où on met les priorités. Euh, donc, c'est des questions qui sont fondamentales puis qui doivent être adressées aussi à l'échelle politique, pas juste, euh, euh, pas juste au niveau terrain, si on veut, parce que je pense qu'il y a une réelle volonté de la part des, des éducateurs, de la part aussi des gens du milieu journalistique, Mais maintenant, il faut amener cette volonté-là et euh, ce principe-là à l'échelle politique aussi. Normand, et puis Kevin. Me permettrez-vous d'être disgracieux? Je, je connais beaucoup d'entre vous dans la salle et vos travaux. Sur certaines questions, j'ai presque envie de vous pointer et vous demander de vous exprimer. Euh, donc, avec votre permission, j'aurais très envie, là, en fait, de relancer la question à nos amis de Dabilo Media, qui font le travail depuis, depuis une vingtaine d'années d'être en discussion, euh, notamment auprès des, politi des politiques fédérales et provinciales, pour rentrer le truc à l'agenda politique. Donc, auriez-vous euh, peut-être euh, quelques commentaires sur les, les enjeux et les difficultés que vous avez rencontrées dans, dans le courant de votre mandat? So, this is a question we get a lot when we talk uh, to people at the federal level. Uh, as Kevin already mentioned, in Canada, of course, education is a provincial and territorial responsibility. But there needs to be federal leadership. And Media Smarts, originally the Media Awareness Network, for those of you who go way back, is an example of the kind of leadership that the federal government once showed in this area. Because we were created coming out of uh, the Spicer Commission in the 1990s. Um, as a model where there would be a federal, uh, a, not a federal, but a, a national organization uh, that was meant to be originally a network, bridging practice about media literacy across the country. Um, there have been reasons why we've become less of a network and more of an organization that does our own resources, but I think whoever winds up playing this role of being a network, of bringing the researchers and practitioners together, I think it does need to be done. Um, I think it is a way that the federal government can show leadership without overstepping its roles by providing resources, by providing inspiration, by bringing people together. And I am going to say, though, going back to number three, that it is essential if this network become, if this network exists, that it connect with teachers in the classroom, um, because they are the people on the front lines, uh, including, in a, I think nowadays, especially elementary teachers, who uh, I think are the, the very front line, and if any of you have young kids, you know what I'm talking about, uh, that young kids are encountering these issues earlier and earlier than they ever have before. And uh, that community groups, people who represent parents, uh, physicians who work with kids, like the Canadian Pediatric Society and the people they represent. Uh, everyone who connects to youth has to be brought into this in some way for this to be effective. It has to be a genuinely national um, mandate and a genuinely national um, project. Pascal, you wanted to jump in here? 
Oui, euh, ben, en fait, une partie euh, quand même importante de mon travail est de faire du lobbying auprès du gouvernement, euh, que ce soit du Québec ou euh, du gouvernement fédéral, euh, afin de défendre les grands principes de la démocratie, de l'importance du journalisme. Et je dois dire que dans toutes les représentations qu'on fait, il y a des aspects qui touchent à l'éducation, puis à l'importance euh, de... de de justement développer cette littératie numérique-là, euh, non seulement dans les milieux scolaires, mais aussi euh, dans la vie quotidienne des adultes euh, qui ne sont plus nécessairement en contact avec, euh, avec le milieu scolaire. Et euh, je dois dire qu'il y a très peu d'appétit. Euh, plusieurs d'entre vous doivent se rappeler, dans les années 2010-2011, la commission Payette au Québec, euh, qui contenait quand même plusieurs recommandations qui touchaient à l'éducation, et euh, à l'éducation média notamment, et il n'y a, a rien qui a été mis en place depuis. Donc, dans les, dans les apparences et dans, euh, dans les propos, euh, les gouvernements se montrent de façon générale assez vertueux à dire que oui, euh, la démocratie, l'éducation citoyenne et tout ça, c'est très important. Mais dans la réalité, je ne sais pas si c'est à cause des changements de gouvernement, euh, à cause de la, la difficulté de légiférer parfois sur des, euh, sur, des, sur des principes politiques importants, mais il y a très peu qui se fait. Et euh, c'est un problème que ça fait longtemps qu'il a été identifié par toutes sortes d'intervenants. Malheureusement, il y a très peu qui, qui a été fait jusqu'à présent. Donc, c'est réellement un défi de, de faire passer le message puis d'avoir des résultats concrets. So, we'll come here and then come back to you, Kevin. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, monsieur. Voilà, bonjour, mon nom est Patrick Vernier. Je suis président du Conseil supérieur de l'éducation aux médias de la Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles. Donc, je viens de, de Belgique. Et je trouve dans les échanges autour de ces deux recommandations qui se renvoient l'une l'autre intéressant de témoigner que c'est des choses qui peuvent fonctionner. Euh, je, euh, voilà, la mise en réseau des acteurs, j'étais un peu observateur tout au long de ces, cette journée euh, et cette soirée. Ce que, ce que j'observe ici euh, dans les échanges et les témoignages, c'est quand même qu'il y a euh, beaucoup d'initiatives venant euh, de secteurs professionnels parfois très différents, euh, on a bien vu les bibliothécaires qui se positionnent, on a bien vu les enseignants, évidemment, qui se positionnent, les acteurs du monde journalistique. Voilà, et je peux témoigner, nous, on a mis en place un dispositif créé par une loi, euh, donc qui ne dépend même pas du gouvernement, mais du Parlement, qui a mis en place une structure de coordination permanente, de mise en réseau des acteurs et de, de, de coordination transversale de ces multiples intervenants nécessaires à l'éducation aux médias. Et donc, je pense que c'est euh, voilà, quelque chose qui peut fonctionner. Euh, maintenant, il ne faut pas rêver. Euh, ce n'est pas une solution miraculeuse. Ce n'est pas ce qui va déclencher une urgence absolue. Mais c'est un travail au long, au long cours. Nous, on existe depuis maintenant plus de dix ans. Et on a des avancées, euh, que ce soit en termes de structuration formelle dans les cadres euh, référentiels de l'enseignement, les programmes scolaires. On a des avancées notamment au niveau des opérations qui permettent à des professionnels des médias d'intervenir dans le cadre scolaire avec des financements publics. Je pense là particulièrement à l'initiative qu'on a euh, eu l'occasion de, 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 de voir hier soir, euh, j'ai oublié son nom, 30 secondes pour euh, je ne sais plus quoi. Voilà, donc voilà, je voulais juste mettre l'emphase et insister sur ces deux recommandations qui me semblent particulièrement intéressantes, dans l'idée, pas seulement d'avoir un réseau d'expertise, mais aussi un réseau de coordination de ces acteurs. Je crois qu'il y, y a les deux fonctions, on a besoin en même temps d'expertise, mais aussi que ces acteurs se parlent. Moi, j'étais surpris dans certains échanges que euh, l'occasion de ce colloque euh, mis en place par les organisateurs ici, c'était peut-être une opportunité pour ces différents acteurs qui ne se parlent pas au quotidien de pouvoir euh, échanger et coordonner leurs actions. Voilà, merci. Kevin, did you want to jump in now? Yeah, sure. I mean, I just was going to say I, I agree with, with, with Pascal. I mean, I, you know, Norma and I are on the board of, of Abido Media, and um, I mean, what we, what we understand from what, from, from what the reports we get um, from, from the Media Smarts team is that, in fact, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of appetite uh, for that sort of stuff federally. But, you know, again, I mean, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about this, but maybe one of the, until now, but I think maybe one of the, one of the ways you might want to emulate this stuff is actually um, on, in the online space, the online safety space. Because the government of Canada has, well, I don't think it's a lot, but they have funding for things in the online safety side. I mean, they have a public campaign, right? It's called, like, Get Cyber Safe, and they have a marketing budget around it, and they're running public service advertising campaigns on it. They have funding, right, that they fund academics, um, you know, to, 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 to actually study this issue of safety. I mean, there, it also, it kind of spills a bit into like counter speech and hate speech and counter terrorism and, and things, and, you know, online radicalization. But 
these are public policy choices. This stuff actually exists in the safety space. And I, I, you know, I, I agree completely. Like, there's no reason why we shouldn't have the same um, kind of seriousness applied to uh, media literacy, especially if you believe that, um, that we're challenged by that, or democracy is challenged by that. There's no, I, I don't see why you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. So we'll move it along to the next recommendation, just again, not because it's not interesting, the conversation, but because we're limited for time. So here we have to develop strategies in media education to reach different socio-demographic groups by including media education in school curricula, which we've talked about before from elementary school starting, but also to build initiatives with media, NGO, and civic education adopted for various publics. So this is the idea of building media education that actually speaks to different experiences, which we heard a lot about since the, the start of this conference, that we need media education that is inclusive and targeted to different uh, socio-demographic groups. So other uh, ideas from the panelists about, uh, about this recommendation specifically? Certainement, et c'est probablement une, une des recommandations qui va plus parler à, à Chenjerai. Euh, je viens essentiellement de la théorie des mouvements sociaux, de la littérature aussi sur les médias alternatifs et communautaires. Et, et ce qui m'a surpris quand je suis rentré un peu dans le champ de l'éducation aux médias, c'était la déconnexion totale et complète entre la littérature scientifique qui s'intéressait au rôle des médias communautaires et alternatifs et de l'autre côté, la littérature qui s'intéresse essentiellement à l'éducation aux médias, donc entre les milieux communautaires et également le, le, le milieu de l'enseignement formel. Pour moi, les médias communautaires et alternatifs ont historiquement joué un rôle absolument prépondérant pour définir le champ, ce qu'est le truc et son utilité sociale et politique. Donc, il est d'autant plus important, si on veut réfléchir à des propositions de politique publique, de reconsidérer et de revaloriser, notamment par le biais de politiques qui visent à supporter nos médias communautaires et indépendants euh, et de les mettre en lien avec nos, nos milieux scolaires euh, également. So, we'll turn it to the audience if you have any comments on this. Uh Anyone? Here we go. And then Pascal, Kevin, I'll come back to you after if you're interested. Go ahead, Bonjour, c'est un tout petit commentaire. À chaque fois que c'est écrit dès le primaire, on pourrait peut-être changer pour dès le préscolaire parce que l'école, souvent, pour la plupart des enfants, commence en maternelle puis il y a déjà des choses qui peuvent se faire dès l'âge de 5 ans. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Uh, any comments from Pascal or Kevin? No? So we do have some slides, uh, some recommendations later on, specifically about community media. Matthew, did you want to get a quick word in? Sure. It's not like you're limited at your number of times to come to the mic. It's just that you have to self-facilitate when yes. you're at the mic so that your comments are brief, okay? Just, no, just very briefly, and, and in reference to uh, one of our speakers last night, I think we have to, at this point, say that the initiatives and media literacy curriculum should not only be adapted for various publics, we need to ensure that all of the communities in Canada, in particular marginalized communities, have an opportunity to participate in the creation and the development of these initiatives and in the development of that curriculum so that the, under the people whose voices are not normally heard uh, we, make, we need to make sure that they are heard in this process because they're the people for whom media and digital literacy is perhaps the most important. Thank you for that. Any other comments on this point? Okay, we're moving on. To, adapt, to update public policies regarding the economic models of media to ensure better quality and greater diversity of information. So again, uh, looking at broader public policies beyond anything targeting specifically media education, but to uh, review the economic models that are shaping some of the quality and perhaps lack of diversity circulating in media. Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> uh, this is a challenging one. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'll just say, um, hmm, how to say this in the right way. Uh, so we, um, so at Facebook, uh, we have a partnership with uh, Ryerson University, their School of Journalism and the Digital Media Zone, and it's called the Digital News Innovation Challenge. Um, and I think you can, I think you can look it up. But I think it's um, digitalnewsinnovation.ca. Anyway, this was a program that we just did as a pilot program, uh, where we selected five, or we didn't, sorry, Ryerson selected five uh, entrepreneurs in the news space. Uh, to build five new kind of news businesses using different models. And I think the, the, the interest there was trying to see whether or not there was enough innovation in that space, and, and meaning like are there new models to do things 
um, are there actually new niches, right? We have one, it's a really interesting one. It's these three young ladies who quit really well-paying and professional jobs to do this. And they created this, 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 um, this, this journalistic outlet called The, uh, the Gist. And it's, three, uh, it, and it's focused on f f sports coverage, but written for women. That's really interesting. Um, and, and, so, and so I think there is a lot of potential there. Um, I, I, I think that there are, gonna, there are certain industries um, that have resisted sort of, um, sort of uh, changing some of the ways that things have been done historically. And this is sort of not me saying this. This is, this is the, uh, the director of the Ryerson School of Journalism, so Janice Neal. So her point was like, doing these sorts of things allows us to figure out whether or not there is actually capacity for innovation and sort of path-breaking path things uh, in the way that news thinks about monetization and the way that news thinks about what it is, what it is in, in, a, in a digital society. So I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Pascal, last night, Chenjirai had brought up the fact that uh, workers through their unions should be trying to change the way that capitalism structures media. So thinking outside of monetization, perhaps, and other aspects in which media can be shaped. Um, do you have thoughts on, on this issue with regard to public policies and economic models of media? J'en ai beaucoup de pensées. En fait, ça obsède mes journées euh, et mes nuits. <laughs> euh, en fait, euh, je trouve le, le titre du congrès de la FPJQ tout à fait à propos, parce que la question qu'il pose, c'est est-ce que le bon journalisme va suffire à traverser la crise des médias? C'est peut-être pas euh, dit exactement de cette façon-là, mais c'est la question qu'ils vont poser dans le cadre de leur congrès. Puis, euh, je dirais que cette question-là, elle est fondamentale parce qu'il y a toutes sortes de bons journalisme qui se fait à toutes sortes de différents niveaux, que ce soit du côté communautaire, alternatif, traditionnel. Il y a du bon journalisme. Pour moi, le problème, il n'est pas de ce côté-là. Le problème, il est là. C'est trouver des moyens de financer les médias. Euh, et, et ça, je veux dire, il y a une réalité qui est incontournable. Les revenus des médias traditionnels, qui étaient en tout cas au Canada, parce qu'au Canada, on n'a pas une tradition de soutenir par des fonds publics les médias, euh, notamment de la presse écrite. Donc, les deux sources de revenus principales, c'est-à-dire les abonnements et la publicité, sont en chute libre, et ça, de façon, à mon avis, irréversible. Et c'est le cas depuis dix ans. Pourquoi? Parce qu'il y a un éclatement euh, des, des, des possibilités pour les annonceurs qui fait en sorte qu'il euh, y a des places où ils peuvent annoncer à, à très bas coût alors que de soutenir la production de contenu d'information, de soutenir des salles de nouvelles, ça, c'est extrêmement coûteux. Alors, la problématique, elle est réellement là. Moi, je crois qu'on doit s'inspirer notamment du système canadien télévisuel, euh, alors que dans certaines années, dans les années 90, euh, on s'est dit collectivement que le Canada méritait d'avoir une production télévisuelle de qualité, malgré que notre marché ne suffit pas à soutenir tout cet univers de production-là. Donc, on s'est tanné de regarder Dallas et Dynasty sur nos ondes et euh, on a imposé, on s'est dit, ceux qui font de l'argent avec nos contenus, donc les contenants, doivent participer à son financement. Et on a fondé le Fonds canadien des médias en imposant une taxe sur la câble distribution. Et cette taxe-là, cette redevance-là, qui est versée dans un fonds, et sert à produire de la télévision de divertissement. Alors moi, je, dis, je me dis, si au Canada... On pense qu'on doit trouver des façons de soutenir le divertissement parce que c'est nécessaire au tissu social puis à notre collectivité, à notre créativité, à notre imaginaire. Ah, ben, je me dis que c'est incontournable pour l'information. Alors, faisons pareil. Qui fait de l'argent avec les contenus d'information? Il y en a plusieurs. Il y a les fournisseurs d'accès Internet, il y a la bande passante et il y a les plateformes numériques. Donc, ce n'est pas compliqué. Il faut que ces acteurs-là qui font de l'argent avec nos contenus qu'il la finance, qu'il participe à son financement, et ça, selon moi, c'est incontournable. So we do have some. So we do have something here specifically about taxing. Um, there was a discussion about a tech tax. Tech. You, you tax? have to let me respond yeah. to that. What's that? You have to let me respond to that. I do, and I will, but I just wanted to bring up the related intervention yeah, yeah. because uh, our colleague from the UK brought up a discussion that's happening there yeah. and in other places, but sure. the idea that big platforms right. should contribute to public interest journalism that could include taxes or other relevant measures. This could also probably 
uh, include contribute to uh, media and uh, media education right. um, policy and development. So. Uh, just to say that these are related, and so we can open up the floor to speak about both of these. And yes, of course, Kevin, you're invited here to respond. Please go ahead. That was great. I mean, look, this is, so thank you for that. I mean, this is a challenging issue, but um, I just, I just want to, uh, I, I think I, well, I, I'll be a little bit tough uh, on this stuff. Like, I'll, I'll just be a little bit factual about this stuff, uh, which I think is probably, anyway, we'll, we'll see. But, um, so this is the thing. So first of all, um, you know, I'm a subscriber to the Globe and Mail, uh, print edition. I still get it delivered to my door. And I've been a subscriber for over 20 years. Um, how many people here still subscribe to a newspaper? <laughs> Two. Well, that's great. I, I subscribe to three. <laughs> but, but so we're doing our part. I think what's happening is that people are not doing that generally, right? Um, so then it becomes, what do you do about that? And I was trying to see more about it a bit. Um, earlier, um, but it really, the question is, it's a source of funds problem, right? So this is what, you know, in public policy, people think about this as a source of funds. You know, we talked to, you know, the, the Finance Canada. This is a source of funds thing. We've got to find the revenue. Um, and, um, and so usually, you know, you, 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 want to, um, you want to tax something that, um, that kind of meaningfully is, it, it makes sense to recycle, so it's kind of like, you know, a carbon tax kind of thing. The problem, I think, with this stuff, and I can only really speak for Facebook, but I think it's probably true for most platforms, is um, Facebook, well, I'll just, I'll just say about Facebook, but I think it's true for many platforms. Facebook is not a mirror of the news. It is not a mirror of a newspaper. It's not an online newspaper. It is fundamentally a platform where in Canada there are 24 million Canadians there are one point, uh, there are, sorry, uh, 2.4, I think, billion people around the world. I think that's the latest number. And what this is is actually, um, it's a mirror, more accurately, a mirror of society. That's why we have, we're challenged in the spaces of online safety and misinformation um, and indigenous culture and content online. It's because we, are, we don't have, we, it's not like there's no editor that decides who can say what. This is, um, this is a platform that gives people voice. <laughs> but, 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 well, but, but, and, and, so, and so statistically, what, let me just ask a question. What percentage of content on Facebook do you think is news content? Four. That's right. Uh, well, actually, no, it's less than four. So 4%, Let's so 4%, it so 4%, so, well, you know, again, you know, on, on average, and I gotta be careful of the number, but something like that. Um, and 4% actually includes, let's say, what La Presse might put on Facebook. But it might also be what Andrew Scheer puts on Facebook, uh, or, what, um, or, what a, or what the Bibliothèque Nationale might put on Facebook, um, or what a small business might put on Facebook. And so, when we think about, we, we actually, so, so again, to cut to the heart of it, we, we don't, we, it's, it's actually inaccurate to say we make money off of journalism. In, in fact, if, if newspapers decided that they didn't want to put things on Facebook, right, if they didn't want to put content on Facebook, I think you know, we, would, we would be, I think we would feel it's regrettable. But, but it's okay. Like, th these are choices. Like, there's The Logic, which is a new um, digital news uh, site, really good. They have a hard paywall. The Toronto Star increasingly is moving towards a hard paywall. Uh, well, they have a metered paywall. I think it's like four, uh, five articles. Um, uh, the, 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 the problem with this sort of stuff is that um, it's individuals who are sharing content onto Facebook. So I'm sharing a link post of an article that I read in Le Devoir or Radio Canada. I want people to see it. But if, if it is the case that publishers wish to um, Put a, erect a hard paywall around content. Um, you know, obviously uh, they could do that, and, and it's not an issue of revenue. Um, the revenue comes from the fact that there are lots of people on Facebook. Most people, and the vast majority of content, is people um, communicating with each other. So that's a hard no to a tech tax. No, no, I, I'm just saying that. Well, no, I, I well. It's not for me to say yes or no. Sure, um, but, but but I think I'm just saying that from a causality point of view, 
and from a consumer, or well, forget about consumer, from an individual behavior point of view, and from a public policy point of view, these things, um, there are, there, there's, it's, it's, it's kind of dissonant. It, it, it's not reflective on all these levels, it's not reflective of actually what's happening. So thank you for that. We should also hear from the audience and we should consider how such attacks could help contribute to public interest journalism, but also media education practices as well. Chenjirai? Yeah, um, thank you so much for this, this robust discussion. I just wanna say, first of all, as you consider, as you answer, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are skeptical that someone who works with Facebook mm -hmm. could come and offer something beyond prepackaged talking points on these issues. So please, when I, you answer, because when I hear you say things like Facebook is a platform that gives people voice, I think I'm just gonna, in an effort to remain on factual, I mean, that's the kind of statement that is like, doesn't take much critical thinking to think that we need a better approach than that. Facebook also silences a lot of voices. When you say Facebook is a mirror of society, I mean, these are, that's to me, these are, what do you mean? You're, this is, you're algorithms, it's not a mirror of society, right? Like we, we've already, we've had a weekend of much more critical thinking than that. So I get that that's what like a public talking point that you might have to say to promote Facebook. So, so I just wanna say, so prior to Facebook, yes. uh, I worked at McGill University. Great. And prior to that I was a director of policy to the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, Jennifer Wonderful. Stoddard. Wonderful. So I just wanna be very clear, this is not, so when you these, say are not, Facebook these, is these are not recycled talking so in the, points. It's great, so, in the, so when you say Facebook is a mirror of society, I mean, I, but to get to the bigger point about taxes, let me just reframe the, I don't, I'm not sure where you went with tax, we were talking about taxes and then you start talking about individual users and subscriptions. Facebook is a company who uses our data and stuff, content that we produce. Facebook is a company that has resisted transparency when it comes to really talking about what happens and all the nature of that data, right? So Facebook is taking, a, is actually using a, a, a variety of public goods right, that it has figured out how to monetize, including news. So in that context, my question is, why would it be so, is it, A, is it ridiculous or absurd, or how, why is it so hard to just accept that Facebook has, is using these public goods to make its money, one, and then two, that in that context, there would be some obligation to the public that might take the shape of a tax. Those just seem like really basic propositions. Sure, but, Kevin, but Kevin, sorry, it's not a direct question and response. That's not the format. Thank you, Chandrai. We will hear from the other people lined up at the mic, but we will also get some feedback. Like, you will get to respond, but it's not a direct uh, no, question and response, okay? No. And but thank you, Chandrai, Colette. Yes, and and he just asked me that directly, though. But no, I, no, I, I know, I know. I appreciate it. It's not the format. He's allowed yes. to raise questions, and you will get a chance to respond. It's just not direct response. Go ahead, right. Colette, please. Uh, and I appreciate, Kevin, that you're here in, in a professional role and that you have to defend your company and I'm sure you are the smartest person in the room. No, no, but no, I, I, know, I, I would still do it anyway, because I fundamentally believe that this stuff Yes, is I'm sure you do, but I'd like to ask, a, I'd no, just please, like please. to ask a question, a very pointed and direct question. What is Facebook prepared to do to contribute to the quality of the media ecosystem in Quebec, specifically in Francophone Quebec in Canada? Uh, I realize that the Ryerson Initiative is great, but uh, what are you prepared to do on your own initiative to support the quality of the media ecosystem. This week, I'm just gonna tell a very small anecdote. I was asked by a friend to intervene in a, a situation of a spotted website, a spotted Facebook page that was harassing a group of 13 and 14 year olds. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had a posted a photo of these kids. They were reporting, uh, you know, deviant behavior at the mall, which was apparently false. These kids are getting death threats. And there is nothing in the community standards of Facebook that you can do to report this kind of harassment. All you, they tell you to do is call the cops. And this content has been online, I think, about a week now. The parents are going crazy. And it's just, I mean, this is not about news and journalism. But, I mean, this is just an example. No, I think you're absolutely right. It's a much broader challenge. And so, but the thing is, it's on Facebook. And there's nothing anybody but Facebook can do about it. So that's one issue. Uh, but about the quality of the media ecosystem, the quality of information. I mean, do you at least recognize that you are playing an important role, even if it's only 4% of Facebook, it's a huge chunk of public debate in Quebec, in Francophone Canada. Do you at least recognize that? So again, before we come back to direct response, because we have a couple more people lined up, let's give them a chance to, to have their quick one minute oui. intervention, and then we can come back to the panel. Alors, rapidement. 
Merci, effectivement, d'être là pour répondre aux questions. Mais pour moi, c'est une illustration comment tout peut être viré à l'anecdote et à la blague. Dans vos réponses, au lieu de choisir des réponses englobantes, vous y allez avec des petites anecdotes qui ne répondent pas aux questions, dans le fond, des besoins qu'on a en termes d'éducation aux médias. Si on regarde à une échelle encore plus large, euh, le, ce qu'on vit actuellement avec euh, l'ère des médias et de Facebook, c'est qu'on va être diverti jusqu'à la mort du journalisme, c'est sûr et certain. Et je retiens d'aujourd'hui ce qui a été dit par M. Quinn, « Follow the money », on sait où est l'argent. L'argent devrait être redistribué parce que Facebook est plus gros que Mark Zuckerberg au moment où on se parle. C'est une machine qui va dévorer le journalisme et peut-être, par extension, le sens critique. Merci. Merci. Sharon? I just want to ask, um, that 4% statistics about news uh, producers, does it cover Africa? Uh, so, so, so someone said the 4% number. It is approximately that. I think it kind of will fluctuate. So let's not fix, but let's just say a very small percentage. It's a global number. It would be sort of how we think about content um, globally on the platform. So okay. worldwide. Okay, so, so I should know how you think about content in Africa because these things are not done in a vacuum. You say it's the voice of the people. You give people the, a voice. But what kind of voice do people have? When people talk um, on Facebook in Africa, what we see is a reflection of what has happened in the news, what has been reported in the news. In fact, a lot of um, pictures, memes, and all of that that we see on Facebook are based on what has been reported in the news. So um, talking about um, this um, uh, mandating big platforms to contribute, uh, I don't think it will be wrong or it will be out of place to um, support um, NGOs and uh, civil society organizations who will be interested in um, media education on your platforms. I think um, you should consider that. Um, and uh, beyond that, I want to raise um, a, an example I was sharing yesterday about um, a, an incident on Facebook um, in Nigeria. Um, this lady got involved with some friends unknown and then was invited to a particular place. She met with them, she was raped, and she was killed. You know, just like that. And all we hear on the news is uh, the fact that, oh, this happened because it was um, Facebook that, you know, um, 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 provided an, an avenue for that interaction. So if we have that and we keep having it, and of course, when Mark Zuckerberg was in Africa, you needed to see how people turned out, you know, to see him, so to see him and to talk to him and to interact with him. So this is really making him, Facebook more popular than our conventional media. And of course, you have to take that in, in mind when you are considering your um, CSR. Um, I think it's very, very important. Thank you. So we'll come back to the panel and have a, a quick go around for people to have interventions on this point with regard to uh, taxing uh, the big platforms with regard to public interest journalism and media education and the benefits of that. So uh, Kevin, you wanted to jump in here, but also Pascal and Normand, mm. and we'll finish up on this point and move along to the others, okay? <laughs> we, could, we could spend so much time on this. I know, uh, it could um, be the rest of the session. Yeah, You'd be very no. happy with that, Kevin, but uh, we're really gonna spend five minutes no, for no, no, you fine. all to jump in, okay? Yeah, I, I, mean, uh, I mean, a couple of things, I guess. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure, I honestly, to be honest, I mean, uh, so people have to stop assuming that because I work for a company that my lines are talking points. I mean, that would be awful. Like, then it's like, how would I live with myself? Like, I actually would submit to you that if you talk to, let's say, human rights scholars, um, if you talk to the UN Rapporteur on Human Rights, if you talk to constitutional scholars, they have a very different view of what Facebook is. I I'm just putting that out there. You don't have to believe me, you can say it's a talking point. You should go read what they're writing, and you may arrive at different views as to what Facebook is. Um, so I'd say that. How do we make money? I, I'm not sure how we make money off of news directly. I, I, I'm not, I, to be honest, I'm not sure. I, I would like to hear, and, and so I put it back to the audience and I want to hear it, because I, I'm not really sure what the, um, the articulation of that is. Um, so I want to hear that one, um, because we, we make money off of ads 
people place ads there because of certain technologies that exist on Facebook and because there are lots of people there and they want to reach audiences, which is not actually so different from the radio or from the newspaper in that regard. You're trying to reach a particular audience. So I, I want to understand how does the absence or the presence of news affect the ability for an online platform to um, make money. I, so I just said, pool de Quebec. Um, ma, ma femme est québécoise. Elle habite à Ottawa, peut-être moins, 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 moins intéressant pour, euh, ici. Euh, mais, et ça c'est une anecdote, oui, mais um, je pense que ça souligne un peu um, comment uh, les gens peuvent connecter avec de l'information en ligne et sur Facebook. Alors ma, ma femme et moi, on habite à Ottawa avec nos trois enfants. Elle voulait, euh, elle voulait être euh, abonnée euh, au, de, au, au devoir parce qu'on lit le devoir, euh, mais euh, malheureusement, le devoir ne livre pas chez nous, même si on est juste comme un pont euh, du, euh, de, de Gatineau. Ça ça, ça, ça fait longtemps. Ça, ça, mais non, mais, mais, mais c'est vrai, mais, mais, mais l'histoire est vraie. Alors, ce qu'elle a fait, c'est qu'elle a commencé à, 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 à... On peut contrôler le fil d'actualité sur Facebook, ce n'est pas seulement basé sur les algorithmes, on peut à prioriser Um, les choses sur Facebook. Et elle a dit que moi, quand je vais en ligne, là, je ne veux pas voir ce que mon mari est en train de faire toujours à Facebook, parce que je poste des photos, des choses comme ça. Uh, je veux voir les articles de Le Devoir, Radio Canada et la presse en premier, chaque fois. Il y a une grande distribution sur Facebook. Et je pense que c'est pour, pour cette raison-là qu'il y a beaucoup de publications, mais aussi des, des, des ONG, des, um, des, des compagnies, des autres organisations qui sont sur Facebook parce qu'ils veulent, euh, euh, ils veulent avoir la distribution qui est, qui est offerte par Facebook. Um, I recognize we have responsibility um, for, uh, for being part of the news ecosystem. We are doing a bunch of different initiatives. I mentioned the one at Ryerson. We do some stuff on sort of subscription accelerators in the US. Um, but, these are, um, but these are really, uh, these are really hard things. At, So we, we have absolutely recognize our role in the ecosystem, but we recognize our role also as an enabler of voice. And people laugh at it a bit, but I'm actually surprised that, that people are, are, because I just spent you know, a week, this media, media Literacy Week, as you all know, and so that's why we're here. Uh, there's a lady by the name of Paulette Senior. She is um, the CEO of the Canadian Women's Foundation. I don't know if folks, if folks here might know her or know of her. Uh, she posted uh, about Media Literacy Week online, uh, in social media, and she was talking about how, um, this is, you know, and she, she wrote this, she, she said that actually, um, you know, when, when she thinks about media literacy, uh, it's that the internet has given voice to so many women. And she started at the top by saying, you know, think about the Me Too movement. It's called hashtag Me Too, not, not because Uh, a, a bunch of us uh, decided that time was up and we should, we, and we should, we should challenge things that have happened for, 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 for many years in society. Um, it's because a lot of brave women decide that it was time to speak up and they're able to do that online uh, because now they do have voice. Um, and this is not Kevin Chan saying, this is not a talking point. This is Paulette Senior, the CEO of the Canadian Women's Foundation, a very respected, very credible woman who is, part, is very entrenched in the Canadian women's movement. Um, the, 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 the last thing in terms of, in terms of, and why I sort of started at the beginning about this kind of source of funds thing, is, I mean, there are ways to do this. So Michael Geist, who you may know is a professor uh, of, of law at the University of Ottawa, kind of one of the Canada research chairs, one of Normand's colleagues, um, his point would be, um, if, if, you want to, if you want to fund this stuff, there is a way, um, you know, the government, uh, has uh, historically reaped proceeds from the auctioning of Spectrum, right? Spectrum, you know, for radio waves, right? For the use of, of you know, 4G, but now 5G. His argument would be, you reap billions of dollars in that. If as a society we believe this is important, it might be interesting to see whether or not we should recycle some of this, um, th these enablers in terms of infrastructure for the internet back into uh, the content side. So Pascal, Normand. Oui, mais merci. Euh, je vais essayer de garder ma réponse courte pour laisser du temps aux autres. Euh, je voulais dire, en fait, pour amener ça dans des éléments très, très concrets par rapport à la problématique, c'est que dans la réalité, dans le marché canadien, 
l'information, la, la production de l'information n'a jamais été financée à partir des revenus d'abonnement. Okay? Ça, ça a été financé à partir des revenus de publicité parce que le marché est trop petit pour que la responsabilité d'avoir un journalisme de qualité repose sur une responsabilité individuelle. Ça repose sur la publicité. Bon, il y a, il y a beau avoir seulement 4 peut-être de contenu qui provient des médias traditionnels sur Facebook, mais Facebook remporte aujourd'hui environ 70 de la tarte publicitaire. Maintenant, moi, je m'attends à peu près 70 mais, 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 Alors, qu'est-ce que Google est, fait? C'est vrai, excusez. Que fait? Pardon, Facebook et Google, à peu près 70 Puis moi, quand je parle des médias, euh, des, des, des nouvelles plateformes numériques, je parle bien sûr de Facebook, mais de Google aussi. Donc, environ 70 de la tarte publicitaire aujourd'hui se retrouve entre les mains de Facebook et Google. OK? Donc, moi, je ne m'attends pas à ce que quelqu'un de Facebook, puis je, je respecte votre position et tout ça, je ne m'attends pas à ce que quelqu'un de Google ou de Facebook me dise « Oui, on veut participer au financement euh, du journalisme. » C'est une entreprise privée, puis son seul objectif, c'est faire de l'argent. Puis d'ailleurs, c'est… Mais le, le principal objectif, c'est faire de l'argent. Et d'ailleurs, Google, Facebook sont parmi les entreprises les mieux capitalisées de la planète. OK? Donc, ça, ça c'est vrai. Donc, en bout de ligne, moi, je ne m'attends pas à ce que Facebook et Google distribuent leur argent pour favoriser euh, le journalisme de qualité. Par contre, on a des gouvernements et eux, une de leurs responsabilités, c'est de répartir la richesse et de s'assurer qu'elle n'est pas concentrée entre les mains d'une poignée d'individus mais qu'on est capable, comme société, de se donner les moyens d'avoir une société cohérente. Et un des fondements de notre société, c'est le journalisme. Le journalisme de qualité, le journalisme professionnel. Alors là, moi, j'interpelle à nouveau les gouvernements, ce qu'on fait depuis des années. On ne doit pas attendre que Facebook et Google aient envie de nous donner de l'argent. On doit les obliger. Euh, Normand. Normand, do you have a comment on the, the mandate that big platforms have to promote media education? J'aimerais un peu nous, nous ramener au niveau vraiment de l'éducation média. Pour, euh, moi qui est un fan de l'éducation média, je le qualifierais en fait de deux, deux qualificatifs qui, qui sont absolument essentiels, euh, défensif et préliminaire. L'éducation média est historiquement une réponse à une économie politique des médias qui génère des dysfonctions au sein de nos sociétés, essentiellement. Au départ, on avait les médias de masse avec un contrôle très, très marqué, en fait, de la diffusion d'informations, l'absence de rétroaction, des messages qui étaient forts, il y avait des craintes sur le bombardement et les effets des médias qui étaient présupposés directs. Maintenant, on est beaucoup plus nuancé. Mais il y a eu tout un champ de la littérature qui s'est développé sur le fait que peu de compagnies contrôlaient beaucoup des trucs que nous voyons et auxquels nous étions exposés. L'éducation aux médias est née dans ce contexte-là. Maintenant, le contexte a changé. Mais l'éducation aux médias est toujours comme fonction de réagir un peu de manière défensive à une économie politique des médias qui génère des problématiques sociales qui sont concrètes. Deuxième point pour moi, l'éducation aux médias est toujours préliminaire, c'est-à-dire qu'elle est fondatrice à un développement de pratiques médiatiques qui sont jugées transformatrices, ou ce que ma collègue Becky Lenz de l'Université McGill appelle la « media policy literacy » aussi, c'est-à-dire que lorsque nous considérons que les dysfonctions dans l'économie politique des médias génèrent des problématiques, et que nous avons développé un sens critique sur notre consommation et la production de l'information, le prochain pas naturel et nécessaire à faire, c'est de demander des changements au niveau des politiques qui sont mises en place, essentiellement. Et c'est un peu ce qu'on est venu faire ici. Donc, je vous enjoindrai à vraiment à maintenir la conversation, ou peut-être à penser l'éducation aux médias en termes de réaction à une économie politique qui peut être problématique, mais ensuite à imaginer l'éducation aux médias comme dans une étape préliminaire de prise d'action conséquente pour réagir à ces dysfonctions. Merci. And we do have recommendations that move behind or beyond the, the big platforms. Um, so it won't just be about Facebook for the rest of the night. Uh, but we have the next recommendation we'll move on to. Sorry, Sharon. Oh, seven. Do you want to get on the microphones, Sharon? Sorry. Um, look at it again. And look at the word mandate big platforms. Maybe we should remove the word big and put something else. Because when we say, because there could be other platforms, I don't know what criteria we're using for the concept big. There could be other platforms that will be relevant in that context. So I don't know what to put there, but I don't know if 
Sure. We can. Yeah. But that's, an, that's a great comment, too, because even if you don't know what wording to replace in a recommendation, just problematizing wording by saying, hey, big, maybe it's too vague, maybe we could be more specific, even if you don't have a suggestion, these are the kind of comments that we can hear. We're going to move on to the others, and of course, if you have comments on these, uh, you can bring them up as you come along. So we have public sites over targeted advertising, including a public archive of online ads. Any comments on this or questions about wording? Are you Is this a platform question again? Uh, it could be a platform question. <laughs> no, Do you want to speak about what's happening here on it will certainly Facebook? Is. So, I mean, so, and I don't mean to monopolize the time, it's just I think we agree that the majority of the comments are directed at platforms, so I, I feel like I do need to respond. But before I do, because I don't want to silence any voices, I mean, do, 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 does anybody want to comment on that? Because I mean, I think this is sure. about us again, so I want to say something. Uh, it, I think it's in general, targeted advertising, not specifically just on Facebook, but in other platforms that people sure. experience targeted advertising as well. But that there be a public archive of uh, online ads. One thing that's missing from here is the role of, say, influencers or other kind of content that comes not necessarily through advertising, but is paid for content, right? So, um, so how can this policy recommendation, this recommendation also address some of the other paid content that's not necessarily advertising, but perhaps influencers and others is something to consider. Uh, other thoughts, comments? Did uh, Pascal, you wanted to jump in here? Oui, euh, ben en fait, euh, la situation financière ou aussi les médias font en sorte qu'ils sont extrêmement vulnérables à toutes ces questions-là. Il euh, y a une réelle problématique ou en tout cas des, des, des questions, des réelles questions à se poser au niveau, euh, au niveau éthique par rapport au, à la cueillette de données, par rapport à, à l'analyse puis par rapport à l'utilisation de ces données-là. Euh, donc, il y a absolument la question des archives publiques, mais aussi d'une transparence dans l'utilisation des données, puis dans la façon de s'en servir, à qui elles sont vendues, de quelle façon elles sont utilisées. Puis, je crois que l'avantage de certains médias d'information, c'est que ces médias-là ont un rôle éthique et donc ils vont prendre en général des mesures quand même un petit peu plus... Euh, euh, structuré pour protéger d'une certaine façon euh, les lecteurs, les consommateurs. Euh, L'autre chose aussi, c'est que à, ce qui est dangereux, à mon avis, puis ce à quoi on doit réfléchir, puis les organisations syndicales, puis les journalistes ont absolument cette responsabilité-là de se questionner là-dessus, c'est que l'utilisation des données, euh, c'est une chose quand on l'utilise à des fins publicitaires, C'en est une autre quand on, quand on l'utilise à des fins de cibler du contenu d'information. Puis ça, c'est quelque chose que je crois qu'on va voir de plus en plus. Alors, la transparence, une archive publique, mais il doit y avoir autre chose qui va beaucoup plus loin euh, sur l'utilisation des données, la façon dont, dont la publicité est ciblée, mais la façon dont les médias s'en servent aussi de toutes les autres façons. Maman ou Kevin yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, in the, in the digital world, I think this stuff actually is about platforms, mostly. Um, so I, w I should respond. Um, I'm sorry, Norman, this is taking us away from media literacy a bit. But, but it is one of the recommendations. So, um, we, uh, so we don't oppose that. Uh, we already ha that already exists in the United States, in Brazil, and in the United Kingdom. There is a public archive, a six-year rolling average. Uh, sorry, six years rolling archive. You can actually see all the ads. Um, that are run on Facebook uh, that are political ads. Um, and um, I think there is a bill before the House, or I think it's now in the Senate, C-76, which would require the creation of a public archive um, for online platforms of a certain size uh, for electoral periods. And we don't oppose that. We support that. Um, and so I think that's, I mean, that's, that's that. So it sounds like a good recommendation. Next up, nine uh, and 10 both deal with community media. The first one is make community media and public library libraries uh, first-hand partners in ending fake news by giving them the funding needed to achieve their mission, popular education, to every citizen. The next one is uh, broader than specifically community media, but it includes them. It says recognize the field work done by organizations and community actors working in popular education about media and information. Mm -hmm. So this is expanding the role of who's involved, but also who's involved in leading uh, these movements for media education. Thoughts on this? 
Um, J'ai presque envie de renvoyer à Colette Brin, en fait. Je pense que c'est toi, Colette, qui disais tout à l'heure qu'il y avait un risque dans ce genre d'événement-là ou encore lorsqu'on parle d'éducation média, qu'on réinvente la roue. Um, nous avons déjà au Canada des médias communautaires qui font de l'éducation aux médias depuis des décennies avec une expertise constituée et qui sont d'ores et déjà présentes au sein des communautés. <rire> Donc, la, la, plutôt que réinventer la roue, euh, on pourrait peut-être commencer à les reconceptualiser comme des acteurs incontournables, en fait, de l'éducation aux médias et de considérer que dans leur mandat de donner parole, ils donnent aussi une expertise et, et, euh, et un, une voix à des communautés qui n'auraient pas accès si ce n'était pas de, de leur service. Donc, je trouve que c'est une recommandation qui est particulièrement importante dans le cadre de nos discussions. Et je nous encourageais aussi collectivement à voir les acteurs qui sont avec nous depuis longtemps et qui sont sous-utilisés ou sous-valorisés. J'ai eu de nombreuses discussions avec les bibliothécaires scolaires. Ce sont nos alliés cruciaux au Québec pour faire de l'éducation à l'information et elles doivent pouvoir prendre pleinement leur rôle dans les bibliothèques, dans les bibliothèques scolaires euh, également. Uh, any thoughts from the audience on the role of community media and libraries perhaps working ha together um, in leading the media education uh, movement and also the idea of bringing together different actors um, working in, in popular education about media and information, Colette? C'est juste un, un petit détail là, pour... Oups, on est retourné en arrière. En avant. OK. Euh, ben, Peut-être juste, euh, puisque Normand parlait des bibliothèques scolaires, euh, je ne sais pas si... Euh, là, c'est écrit des bibliothèques publiques. Je ne sais pas s'il faut élargir ou euh, mmh. rajouter bibliothèques et scolaires ou mmh. juste parler des bibliothèques en général. Euh, mais euh, je vous laisse, enfin. Peut-être que d'autres auraient... Des spécialistes auraient des meilleurs. Ah, d'accord. Donc, bibliothèque et scolaire, ce serait, je, je me ferais mienne votre recommandation. Yeah. Oops. Emily? Oui, on avait ajouté scolaire euh, dans la dernière version de la proposition, mais là, elle n'apparaît pas. Euh, mais effectivement, euh, le but, euh, c'est effectivement de, 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 de faire tout ça avec les, les gens qui sont déjà présents sur le terrain. Parce que là, on, on sait, là, les fake news sont de plus en plus présentes. Éventuellement, le gouvernement va vouloir s'en mêler, il va mettre des politiques il, euh, en place, il va donner des fonds. Puis, des fois, par, pour, pour, euh, pour avoir à travailler avec euh, le différents paliers de gouvernement euh, régulièrement, il aime ça créer des programmes, puis là, euh, starter des nouvelles affaires. Mais c'est ça, je pense que c'est important de leur rappeler qu'il y a déjà des choses qui existent et que ça ne donne rien de créer quelque chose d'autre pour euh, régler un problème qui pourrait facilement être pris en charge par euh, les communautés avec ce qui existe déjà euh, sur le terrain. C'est pour ça qu'on trouve important de, de le mentionner. Merci. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we'll move along to the next ones. Um, so we have 11 and just two more after this. Implement education for a positive identity in the digital age, including digital transliteracy in the Quebec curriculum by collaborating with educational actors. Uh, we were going to have a quick word about uh, positive digital identity or the idea of having a positive identity in the digital age, just to sort of unpack what this phrase might mean. So please go ahead. Oui, merci. Euh, nous, en fait, on a développé un projet euh, spécifiquement sur l'identité euh, positive à l'ère du numérique. Ce que ça sous-entend, en fait, c'est euh, que plutôt de, que de dire aux élèves quoi penser, ce qui est bon, ce qui n'est pas bon, quoi faire ou ne pas faire, ça, c'est la meilleure façon de les mettre au défi. Euh, on s'est dit qu'on voulait les accompagner dans le développement de leurs critères éthiques, euh, leurs valeurs et la signification qu'ils attribuent à l'usage des pédagogies, euh, des, des, euh, des, des technologies, pardon, plutôt que nous, comme adultes, de se positionner et de sanctionner euh, leurs comportements, leurs attitudes, leurs valeurs. Donc, on doit se positionner comme enseignant euh, en tant qu'une euh, posture de guide euh, qui euh, n'est pas euh, un guide moral, mais bien qui guide des discussions éthiques, euh, qui amène les élèves à examiner les points de vue et évaluer les actions ou les options qu'ils ont, qu'ils peuvent poser en regard du numérique. Et le but ultime, c'est de faire émerger chez les élèves les enjeux, les dilemmes éthiques et les décisions à prendre en lien avec les usages du numérique. 
Également, bien, on leur fait prendre conscience de leurs besoins qui sous-tendent leur comportement sur le web euh, et on légitime ces besoins-là. C'est très important. Donc, oui, je veux des likes, j'ai besoin d'appartenance. Pourquoi je fais ça? Bien, ça m'amène de la popularité, c'est important. Comment on y répond à ces besoins-là maintenant? Bien, ce sont aux élèves également d'y répondre. Et on fait le pari qu'en faisant ça du primaire à la fin du secondaire, même du préscolaire à la fin du secondaire, eh bien, il y aurait euh, probablement un cheminement qui se fera et une évolution naturelle de la façon dont se positionnent nos jeunes, à tout le moins. Pour cette clientèle-là, on a euh, le, le, le pari de, de croire qu'une fois derrière leur écran, c'est eux qui prennent les décisions et qu'à ce moment-là, leurs décisions vont être plus éclairées et leurs choix euh, seront peut-être plus éthiques. Voilà. Merci. Comments, thoughts from the panelists on this idea? Très rapidement, si vous voulez voir un projet en éducation aux médias qui fonctionne magnifiquement bien, qui est très prometteur, allez voir Marie, allez voir Patrick, ils sont dans le coin là-bas, ils vont vous inspirer, ça vaut la peine. Donc, prenez deux minutes pour leur parler d'ici la fin de la journée. Perfect. So, let's move on. The, that media education is part of training for citizenship and democracy, rooted in critical approach and the development of intellectual, social, emotional capacities. The next one is also about citizenship. Is the, that media education, this is part of the same, no? Okay, so it's the next one, sorry. Uh, mobilize civil society in the elaboration and implementation of media education means. So uh, these two both thinking about uh, citizenship and civil society. So again, that um, media education be part of training within a broader um, goals of, of uh, citizenship and democracy. And then this one, mobilizing civil society in implementing media education. Thoughts about this? Pascal? Ben, euh, oui, tout à fait. Puis en fait, euh, parce qu'on parle beaucoup du milieu éducatif et tout ça, mais j'ai une préoccupation aussi pour les gens qui euh, sont sortis du réseau scolaire depuis euh, assez longtemps, puis qui naviguent malgré tout avec euh, tous les nouveaux outils technologiques et qui n'ont pas euh, eu l'occasion ou, ou en tout cas l'habileté ou en tout cas le temps de, de développer ce sens critique-là. Euh, alors, je crois aussi qu'il doit y avoir une préoccupation de ce côté-là. Est-ce que c'est par des programmes de prévention, comme on le fait, contre le tabagisme ou contre euh, à peu près toutes sortes euh, d'autres euh, problèmes ou, ou, ou éléments là, qui, qui sont importants dans, dans la société? Euh, mais il faut se préoccuper, à mon avis, aussi des gens qui sont sortis du réseau scolaire parce que euh, pour euh, naviguer comme tout le monde là, ici sur euh, les réseaux sociaux, on voit beaucoup de commentaires et de partages et ce sont beaucoup des gens qui ne sont plus à l'intérieur des institutions scolaires. Donc, euh, il doit y avoir une préoccupation de ce côté-là aussi. Excellent. So, we also have um, an opportunity to hear perhaps closing words from our panelists and then we'll conclude the day. It's been uh, a rapid session reviewing the 13 very different ideas uh, coming out and recommendations coming out. We have, uh, of course, heard your questions and your suggestions in developing that, and that will be applied going forward by the project team. But uh, before we go to uh, hear final words from our panelists, if there's any further comment on these recommendations, and uh, we'd like to hear from you, but very, very briefly. Sharon, you wanted to speak, please? Yeah, you said there are 13. I was actually waiting for, for us to see the last one before I make my comments. Is this um, not the last one? Which one are you? This is the last one. Yes, I just okay. wanted to be sure that this is the last one. Sure, it is the okay, last one. Okay, go to number four, please. Um, Coming up. There we go. Um, I think this is very relevant even outside Canada. Um, it's important for government to recognize the importance of the challenges facing media and citizenship education by investing resources. First, they need to recognize that there's a problem at hand. And um, from there, um, other things can follow. So for us in Africa, this is very, very important. Um, then I think there's one thing that we are leaving undone. Um, I started my presentation by mentioning that um, it is because uh, media ethics is failing. There is a deficit in media ethics. That's why we are emphasizing on media education. And I think that um, whatever recommendation we are making should not exclude media ethics. We should still it's, we should look for ways in which media education can help to correct whatever deficit we find within media ethics. I don't know how that will work, but I know there are people in this room who can help us structure that. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. It's important to note what's not mentioned. It's always important in deliberative discussions to talk about what's excluded from the conversation so that we can think about it and talk about it next time. Michael? I'm just not sure if we've addressed the idea of media literacy as a type of a bandage that's applied when uh, you know, deep ideological storms are brewing in our horizon. And it, it's a little bit like the example of the banks. Um, one moment it's like, take this loan, student loan, take, you know, buy a house, do this. And then the next moment it's, hey, where's your financial literacy? Like, dude, you know, wh what's wrong with you these days? And, um, and so I, I think there's some structural questions, and, and they're here in these recommendations, but, but nonetheless, we are putting a lot back on agency. It's like, learn this, uh, learn this to teach that, um, get governments to help support this or what have you. And, and the reality is that it places a lot of responsibility back on individuals, and then it's like, we've given you the solution now, how's that feeling for you these days? Um, you know, good luck with it, chump, you know? So for these recommendations, we especially need to tease out some of the systemic issues that can be addressed right. um, coming out of them. But you're right, it's there, it's sprinkled throughout, but to pull it out and kind of foreground it in advancing any kind of recommendations would be portent, important. So uh, passing it back to the panelists for a few closing words, your thoughts on the outcomes of these events, uh, particularly these recommendations, taking them forward, or perhaps if you wanted to speak to something that was not mentioned, again, very briefly as we close out the event. Uh, Pascal, please. Euh, ben, personnellement, j'ai beaucoup appris pendant le colloque, notamment sur le rôle euh, des bibliothèques euh, dans, dans l'éducation aux fausses nouvelles. Je ne sais pas pourquoi, je n'y avais jamais réfléchi avant. Alors, c'est quelque chose que je vais retenir définitivement de ce forum-là, puis que je vais tenter d'amener dans nos recommandations qu'on dépose euh, mémoire après mémoire auprès des gouvernements. Euh, maintenant, pour moi, c'est sûr que euh, pour vraiment en finir avec les fausses nouvelles, puis euh, je crois que c'est une, une utopie provocatrice, mais euh, encore faut-il avoir des vraies nouvelles. Et pour moi, euh, le, le nœud du problème en ce moment, il est vraiment là. Euh, le journalisme vit une crise. Il y a une réelle situation d'urgence. Euh, il y a plus de 260 hebdomadaires à travers le Canada qui ont fermé leurs portes en moins de 10 ans. Une trentaine d'hebdomadaires, euh, de, de quotidiens. Euh, et on, on doit garder ce sens critique envers nos médias traditionnels. Puis j'inclus dans les médias traditionnels les médias communautaires et alternatifs et tout ça parce qu'ils sont là depuis très longtemps. Euh, ils sont nécessaires à la diversité et à la pluralité de l'information et tout ça. Et d'ailleurs, je tiens à préciser que bien qu'on représente la majorité des, euh, des journalistes qui sont syndiqués euh, dans les grandes salles de nouvelles, nos recommandations vont toujours dans le sens de défendre aussi ceux qui ne sont pas syndiqués, les journalistes pigistes, euh, et également euh, les médias euh, comme Ricochet, comme Nouveau Projet, comme toutes les autres qui ont un rôle essentiel à jouer dans la société. Euh, donc, il faut absolument trouver des solutions à cette crise-là parce que euh, le, le meilleur moyen de lutter contre les fausses nouvelles, encore faut-il avoir des journalistes qui font la vérification des faits et qui traitent l'information avec une déontologie euh, qui, qui est reconnue. Euh, et donc, en ce sens-là, j'espère, enfin, on parle à un public d'initiés, mais euh, ce message-là doit entrer dans, dans la population générale. Euh, je ne crois pas que les gens réalisent ce qu'on est sur le point de perdre. Euh, je ne crois pas non plus que les gens réalisent qu'en perdant les médias traditionnels, le journalisme, c'est la démocratie et c'est qui nous sommes en tant que, que, que citoyens, en tant que pays. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment, moi, je vois maintenant le journalisme et mon rôle syndical comme un travail de lutte qui est vraiment très important puis qu'on doit mener jusqu'au bout. Alors, j'invite tout le monde ici qui sont préoccupés par la situation à faire preuve de courage puis à en parler continuellement et à faire tout ce qu'il faut euh, pour transmettre le message tant au gouvernement qu'à l'ensemble de la population parce qu'on ne s'en sortira pas. Et ce qui nous attend, je ne crois pas que ça va nous plaire à mmh. personne. Pas même à ceux qui dénigrent jour après jour le travail journalistique. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I wrote down a few things, and I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards if it's if it's if it's better or, or be easier that way. Um, look, media literacy is so important. So I just want to say that you know, not to what what we're talking about today. It's so crucially important. Um, we're, you know, Facebook's been prou proud to be part of this um, for many, many years, um, and so it's it's obviously um, ever more important uh, in a time when there is we're challenged by um, 
things like misinformation. Um, but we're also challenged by, uh, by the understanding of, 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 of polarization and, and, and where society is. And I, and I think you're right, you know, that there are structural problems that are kind of much bigger, um, that are bearing down on liberal democracies around the world. And, and those are important things that you should, you know, one should unpack. Um, look, so that's, so that's on media literacy. I think clearly people have very strong views about, um, uh, you know, certain things about how news should be funded. I, obviously, I encourage you all to continue the, the, the representation to the government. Um, you, should, you should understand that we have no view uh, on this. Um, and so we are not uh, making any representations to anybody about these things. What I say to you here is basically what I would say on any other, in any other fora or any other forum uh, on, on these issues. I just, I, I don't think I understand the link, the direct link between news articles on Facebook and monetization and, and how Facebook makes money. Personally, I love journalism. And, and that's why I've been so distraught a bit at this this idea that somehow Facebook means that we're that, you know that working at Facebook means we're opposed to journalism or that I am somehow reciting you know as, as a gentleman kind of got a little bit personal and was like I'm just kind of giving talking points. It's not. I, I, you just said Facebook has no view on taxes. No, I just said Facebook has no view on sort of the arguments about 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 the representations that you're making the government about how it should be financed. We're not there to, in other words. We're not there to oppose uh, journalism. What do you mean no view? Facebook, you have a, since Facebook has a view, actually, that's a good question. We have no ad, we, so we have no advocacy well, position. Well, 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 you also said earlier, it's not for me to come up with an opinion on this. So if we're here discussing and you're allowed, we're asking you your opinion on this. You're allowed to have an opinion. So the issue isn't we're asking, you know, it's like, you know, and then you would be like, oh, it's not for me. So I feel like you're kind of advocating this concept of you have no view. I, I don't know that that's accurate, but, um, but, but I think what I've been, I think I tried to be clear about this, is that we, so I, I, don't, I, I don't understand the argument that news content on Facebook allows us to make money. That's what I'm saying. I think I've also said that we do take responsibility for being part of the news ecosystem in the sense that Canadians, and I can only speak for Canada, Canadians uh, do read news on Facebook. That is true. Um, and so to the extent that we can ensure and we can help surface high quality content, where we can help publishers monetize in certain ways, we're gonna try to do that. Um, but in terms of what representations are being made to the government about this stuff, I, look, I just wanna be very clear. I'm not coming here to tell you like, you shouldn't do that. That's what I mean by no view. Um, um, I have a few other things. In terms of misinformation as a phenomenon, what's interesting is we just had an election in Quebec. And we work closely with the Directeur General d'Election Québec, and I can tell you, um, we had exact, and so in other words, they were in close coordination with us. If there was anything they saw that they thought was violating of Quebec election law, they would let us know. If we, we were also very much seized with ensuring that, um, that, that uh, violating content was dealt with, I can tell you that the communication we had with the, with the, with the director's uh, office, the director general's office was all of one. They asked us to, t to take a look at one page. We took it down because we found it was in fact um, impersonating um, the, the actual director general uh, des elections in Quebec. So that was, the, so misinformation, I, I, you know, kind of Simon's point, I, I'm not sure what it is, that, what's the nature of misinformation in Canada, to be honest, and, and in Quebec. I can tell you factually, these are the facts. We had one communication with Election Quebec throughout that campaign, to my knowledge. Um, I, I just want to say, because it got a bit personal, this thing about why do I work at Facebook? I mean, goodness, I, I can see the chasm between sort of how I get up every morning and see myself and sort of maybe what colleagues here in the room might think sometimes. But I have to tell you, I, I don't work at Facebook. I don't know, I'm not sure why you think I work at Facebook. Um, I have to tell you, when I get up in the morning, I go to work at Facebook because I feel like we're having a tremendous impact on the lives of people. We're giving people a voice and maybe people's like, oh, you know, Naples are quiet, you're saying this is not. But I have to, like, I'll give you what, I just wrote down a few examples about the indigenous 
um, question, which I, I feel very passionate about. Um, we have been working with indigenous peoples for as long as I've been at Facebook. And uh, one of the things I'm very proud of doing recently is we, so we do have a policy against hate speech on Facebook. It is implemented imperfectly, uh, I, would, I, would, I would admit. Uh, but we're trying to get better all the time. And so what have we, what have we done in, in Canada? Uh, we did an indigenous content and culture consultation uh, with indigenous peoples and with organizations. One of the big two pieces of feedback, one was there is some hate speech terminology on Facebook that people use to, to attack indigenous peoples and you guys don't do anything, you don't take it down. Um, and so we spent some time understanding what these words are and we've loaded them into our list of slur words and so now whenever, and whenever somebody tries to post these words, um, they're taken down automatically by the system. Um, we've also learned that from, in, from, especially from Inuit people, that you know, being able to interface on Facebook in our own language, in Inuktut, is super important. Um, and so we, we have made a commitment uh, to work with the community in Nunavut, in particular, um, to translate the platform into Inuktut. These are the things that we're doing in public policy. Um, if you go to First Nations communities, I'll just end with this, if you go to First Nations communities and you talk to First Nations communities, they are all on Facebook because connectivity is not great in many of these communities and because they're so small that in fact, they can actually get the entire community, a few hundred people, all into one group and that's how they communicate. Um, and Tanya Talaga, colleague of yours, very well-known journalist, she's the Massey lecturer this year, she's delivering a lecture across the country, uh, you'll hear it on CBC Ideas, um, over the next week uh, on suic indigenous suicide and the challenge that there is. I am super proud. She opens, I think it's at either chapter three or four. She opens that chapter at the Wabano Center for Indigenous Peoples in Ottawa at an event that Facebook co-organized to address the issue of indigenous suicide and how we can help indigenous youth find a voice online. These are super important things. So I'm, I'm sorry, I work at Facebook. I'm proud to work at Facebook. I get up in the morning because I think we're making a tremendous difference in many different people's lives. Um, and I, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that these are talking points because they're not. So thank you both uh, for your final interventions. I wanted to pass it on to Normand as well to give us his uh, very brief final intervention for our long day. Vous me détestez probablement parce que je suis la dernière chose qui tient entre vous et un verre de vin en ce moment. Um, vous avez été excessivement courageux. Vous êtes venu un vendredi soir de pluie en novembre euh, écouter des keynote speakers vous parler de désinformation et d'éducation aux médias. Vous avez passé votre samedi de très tôt le matin jusqu'à tard en après-midi. Merci à vous d'être venu. Ça a été un vrai plaisir. J'espère que vous avez de la matière pour réfléchir, pour continuer à vous connecter les uns avec les autres. S'il vous plaît, si vous avez eu des conversations intéressantes avec nous, également, n'hésitez pas à nous donner des rétroactions. On est ravis de vous connaître, on est ravis d'être en lien avec vous. Euh, et en terminant, je voudrais faire deux catégories de remerciements. La première, et je vous demanderai de donner une bonne main d'applaudissement pour nos bénévoles qui ont travaillé très fort. Je ne vous dis pas à quel point ils ont été cruciaux littéralement dans la réussite de notre événement. Et finalement, je pense qu'elle le mérite pleinement. Je vous demanderai de remercier l'organisatrice de notre événement d'aujourd'hui, Anne-Sophie Letelier, qui est ici et qui a travaillé excessivement fort pour notre succès. Merci. Anne. Merci. Bonne soirée. Merci, Merci tout le monde. Merci.